let me just establish something. We are uh, trying to find a, a common denominator. Okay, that's pretty vague. So let's define it even better. We're looking for really in reality a number of pieces that we can cut all of these pizzas into. So we got the same size pizzas all around. Right? Right? Not looking for the common denominator. Not, not looking for somebody to answer that question. We're gonna walk through how you find that and make sure that it's the smallest one. Okay? Yeah? Well you do um I think it's called factor trees. Yeah. Factor trees. So this will factor it as what? Huh? How can you factor this one? Uh, four and seven. I think. Four and seven. And four is factorable. Two and two. Mm -hmm. We still have seven. <coughs> Twenty factors as five. We have two times two again. Two times two times five. Thirty. So let me reiterate what we're looking for, what it is that the common denom denominator is, okay? Um, it is, again, a number of pieces that we can cut all of these pizzas or pies or whatever into. Well, you know, in essence, every one of these 28 pieces is going to get cut into, <coughs> we don't know how many pieces yet, maybe two pieces, maybe eight pieces, maybe 21 pieces. We need to figure that out, right? So it's going to get multiplied by something, and then that pizza is going to be cut into that many pieces, right? We want the same thing, the same number of pieces for this guy. So we're going to cut each of these 20 into some number of pieces, and there's going to be 20 times that many pieces. And the same for 30. We're going to cut each one of those into 30 pieces. So we need to figure that out. And if we cut all of the pieces in the pizza into this many pieces, or this many more pieces, all five of those are going to get cut into that many more pieces as well, and then we're going to know how many we have all together. There we go. So it comes down to figuring out what is it 30 times something, 20 times something, 28 times something, and we get the same something so that we have these pieces in the same number of pieces. Okay. So I want to explain this. If, you, if it makes total sense, don't push towards the end because you know the answer or whatever. I, this is for anybody who still has any confusion about it. So 28 times something needs to be our common denominator. We can write that here. 28 times something equals something. We don't know what it is. But we're going to pick all the factors of this so that it is the smallest number possible. And 28 needs to go into it. In other words, we need a factor of 2, another factor of 2, and a factor of 7. So we're slowly building our common denominator choosing all the factors that we can use, all the factors, all the numbers that need to go into it, go into it. Question? No, I was gonna just like tell you what else you need. Okay, like what else do you need? Like another two. We need, an, why do we need another two? So, cause we have to get in, get 20 in there. Okay. So. And, uh, and five, but yeah. Let me put it, let me, let me put this to you, question. Um, we need 28 to go into this number, right? Uh, 28 yeah. times something needs to make this common denominator, right? Uh -huh. And uh, and if we have these three factors, then we can make 28. Right? Yeah. So this makes our 28 times something. Yeah. We also need a 20, which takes a 2, a 2, and a 5. All right? We already have two twos. Oh, yeah. Right? So we can, if we include a 5 here, then that makes 20. We're not there yet, but let's look at what we do have so far. We have, uh, let's see, oh, sorry, 20. 20 times 7. So this right now, we have more to do. We haven't quite got there yet, but we do have uh, 140. Okay, let's, let's look at 140. 140 is divisible by 28 because we have a factor of 2, 2, and 7. If you multiply 2 times 2 times 7, you get 28. 28 times 5 is 140. It's also divisible by 20. But 20 is also a factor of 140 because if we group the factors in a different way, we get 5 times 2 times 2 is 20, times 7 is 140. Right? So by picking those factors, we have picked the minimal factors that we need 
make sure we can make a 20 times something and a 28 times something, and by that definition, 20 goes into it and 28 goes into it. Questions? Awesome. No? Okay. But we're not done, right? That's not the common denominator. So far, we only know that 28 and 20 go into it. We don't know if 30 goes into it. So for 30 to go into it, in this number, we need factors of 3 and 2 and 5. Well, we have some of those already. Okay, I'm going to write this. this. We have a 2 times a 5. If we multiply 2 times 5, we get 10. So we just need to be able to multiply that 10 by 3, which we don't have yet. So if I take the, tw the 2 times 2 times 7, I get 28. I get If I take these 2s and put them with a 5, I get a 20. If I take 2 and 5 and 3, that gives me 30. 2 times 5 times 3 is 30. And I don't have any leftovers that I don't need. Like everything I have here is something that I need to have to make all the factors that I need to make. So uh, I can write this new number, the common denominator, as a product of 28 and something, 30 and something, 20 and something. It's 28, right? This part is 28. 28 times whatever is left over here. 28 times 15. Okay, it's also 20 times, well this part is 20, so that's times 3 times 7, that's 21. And it's also 30, this part of it is 30, 30 times 14. 2 times 7 is 14, so 14 times 28, or sorry, 30, 14 times 30 is this common denominator. So what is our common denominator? If we multiply all those factors together, or if we multiply 20 times 21? It's 420. 420. You do 28 times 15, you get 420. You do 30 times 14, you get 420. And that is the smallest number, the least number, that all three of those numbers are a factor of, that they go into. And so that is the least common denominator. It's the smallest number that uh, we can multiply each of these by something. 28 times 15, we have to multiply 5 times 15. 28 times 21, just like 21. 30 times 14, 11 times 14. All right, so 5 times 15, 75, 420 plus. <coughs> 21 times 7, 21 times 7. 47. 147. Over. Over 20 equals, we add those all up. 376. Did you ever write your hand up? Yeah. Okay. I couldn't see it because it was behind there. It was what again? 376. 376. Over 420. Those are both divisible by uh, four. Four. four, okay. And that gives us? Um, 94 over 105. There we go. What's the mixed number again? It's not a mixed number because it's less than one. 105. Oh. 94 divided by 105 is, is less than one, so it's not a mixed number. Is that true? Oh, I thought you said it's less than what? Oh. <laughs> it's less than 105. It's less than 1. Um. Okay. Any questions about that? Remember last time we talked about this method and, and we agreed that it may be an easier way to do it, but I promised you, I made you a promise, and I asked you to trust me that if we can think about numbers as the product of prime factors, Think about the factorization of things. We think of numbers and, and other objects in algebra as being the result of something times something else. That mentality, thinking of numbers that way, thinking of, uh, of even variables as that way, helps us out a lot. Okay? So when you come to these things called polynomials, as you, since before the previous class, have you heard the word polynomial before? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so in pre-algebra you knew about polynomials? Oh, okay. Did you hear about polynomials before? Okay. So, 
polynomials is a is a Stop talking, please. That's what all the shushing is about. Uh, when we come to these things called polynomials, and we can think of them as the product of other polynomials, it will make our life easier. If we put off thinking of things this way, we, uh, we bypass the time when it was easy to think of it this way, there were just numbers, we already know that were products of other numbers, um, then we just make it down the road. So, you know, just trust me, and if there's not some, if there's something you don't understand, trust me that, that it's good to think of it this way, and ask your question. If there's any questions, then ask away. So when we evaluate this, this means we actually do want to find a final uh, number, but it would help a lot if we just write it out the long way and we won't make any mistakes, or be less likely to make mistakes. Okay? So, what we have here is two times a number, right? How do we get that second number? Where is it, it going to come from? Times a number. Two times three times three. Oh, yes. Three times three times three, and then we have this times two. Multiply them however you want. 27 times two, though, is. If I were to. Straight on this next one. What does it mean to raise something to the fourth power? Yeah. Multiply four times. Multiply by four times. What is it? What is the thing that we want to multiply? Negative two. That's what it, that's what it is. Negative two or is it positive two that I want to multiply by itself? Uh, So let's look at this. We've got, say, <coughs> 2 to the <coughs> third. This number right here in the, you know, it's small and, and up and to the right, it means multiply this thing by itself a bunch of times. So in this case, the number is 2. I want to raise 2 to the third power. So 2 times 2 times 2. This gets applied to some number, the number that is right here. Yeah. Let's say, let's go the other way, let's go with what you are thinking it is, and let's change it to uh, 4. Okay, so, yeah. Say I did want to wind up with negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2. Okay. Here we put a power of 4, that means we're multiplying something by itself. How would I tell you that I want the entire thing negative 2 multiplied by itself four times. True? The negative two to the power of four. We do need a negative two. We do need a power of four. Yes? Put a parenthesis between all of it. Yeah, like until I put parentheses, I am I'm not really clearly communicating that it's the negative two, the whole thing that needs to get multiplied four different times. Over here, the four is applied to the two just like it is here. But then there's just a negative hanging out in front. If I want you to bring the, the negative along with the two as I multiply four times, then I move to the direction. So we have a negative. 
whatever, two times itself, four times. What's two to the fourth? 16, so we got a negative 16. After the matrix right, if we were to multiply negative two times negative two times negative two times negative two, times negative two that would give us positive. Parentheses are really important in that. I think, think about it this way. If on a test, I wrote this, I wanted you to, to give me this, and you wrote this down. I feel like there's enough ambiguity. What does ambiguity mean? Work. Work? It doesn't mean work. It just means, hmm? No, no, no. Means like vagueness or uh, lack of clarity, lack of clear instruction, and ambiguity. Yes. Wouldn't that work though? This would work. Yeah. Yes. But here's the scenario so I'm setting that, up. That would not be wrong. Or that would be right. But, but like, or what I'm saying is, here, here's the scenario I'm setting up. I want you to use your imagination. If you wrote this down, and then I marked it wrong, do you feel like you'd have room to argue with me? Yeah. yeah. You should argue with me. Yeah. If I said I marked it wrong, and then you asked me why, and I said, oh, well, see, there's a negative there. So we should multiply a negative two times a negative two times a negative two times a negative two. Pretend that happened. Argue your case. Say, no, what I know about exponents tells me I should do this, Drew. Um, are you saying you're going to do this on purpose to make us like try to argue our point or whatever? I'm making you imagine the scenario. I'm making you imagine that I put this on a test. Uh -huh. yeah. Imagine that you wrote this down, yeah. which I would say is correct. And then imagine, use your imagination, oh, and yeah. say, no, like what I'm saying is, no, you were supposed to multiply four negative twos together. What would you say to argue with me? You should. There's no parentheses, so. Okay, there's no parentheses. Yeah. Right? Four, what does this four up here mean? Okay. That's what it's called, but what does it mean? That if I put a little four up there, I want you to do what? Multiply. multiply four times. Something four times. Yeah, multiply four times. Okay, so the question now that I know what to the four power <laughs> means, the question now is what <coughs> number is it that I want to multiply by itself four times? Well, if it's written like that, it looks like it is only for the two. If I want to use a negative two and get I need to tell you that is the number to multiply by itself four times. I would need to tell you that with parentheses. Now it's the number negative two and a four up front. Like the eight. Or a four up front. Okay. So score each one of those out of five. Score the whole thing out of fifteen. Pass it back. After you get a look at yours, pass it to you. Can anybody sum up why is there an order of operations? And maybe an easier question would be, if there wasn't an order of operations, as Penn does, then how would we know what order to do things? How would I know <coughs> the person who wrote down this problem wanted to do these two things first, and, and then put these two numbers together, and then Result and put those together. Give me two parentheses. Lots of parentheses. Tons of parentheses. Every expression would need a pair of parentheses, a set of parentheses around every pair of numbers in operation. <coughs> every two plus three that you want to go together and get five, you need parentheses around that. It's just about communicating what order you want things done. It's just about the communication of the author to the reader the author of the expression to the reader of the expression. Just like if somebody reads a book and they want to communicate something clearly, they need to use the right punctuation, and if they use parentheses, it means kind of pay attention to these words as a group, aside from these words over here. Um, have you ever seen this example of, oh, let me first write down an example from the video. Six divided by three divided by three. Okay. 
should I divide the 6 and the 3 first and get 2 and then divide by 3 and now I have 2 thirds? Or should I divide the 3's first and get 6 divided by 3 divided by 3 which is 1 and get 6? Which should I do? I can't tell. Right? If we choose to follow the standard order of operations that will reinforce in this class, we would divide from left to right, we do 6 divided by 3 first, we get 2, and so this would result in 2 thirds. What if the person wanted you to get 6? And what should they have done? Parentheses and 2 to direct you to do that first. If we didn't have an order of operations, that's like everything would look like this. No, not this. <laughs> this, right? To that example from the video. Parentheses, parentheses, parentheses. There's no way to mess this up. Right? You put these two numbers together. Put these two numbers together. You will then put them together using subtraction. Then that will be a number. That number you'll add to three. Then you'll have a number. Okay, set that aside for a second. Put these two numbers together. Get that plus this other number. There it is. Right? You showed it again, like a tournament bracket. It's all the way down. It's very clear who is teamed up with who and how you're supposed to do this. In what order. It's just that we would like to save ourselves some time and some parentheses and not have to write parentheses. Having parentheses, we'd like to save and agree to do some, some of these things in a preset order. Does that make sense? That's all the order of operations is. It's not the right way to do things. It's just the way that most of America does it. Okay? I think in European countries, you'll find that rather than treating multiplication and division equally, they treat multiplication as uh, higher in the order, and so they always do multiplication before they do division. Can you do it that way? Yeah. As long as everybody knows that's what you're supposed to do, as long as everybody knows that's what we've agreed to do. Okay. But in my experience, and the experience that I think most people, uh, we'll talk about it more in detail later, but we will multiply and divide at the same level, we'll just do it from left to right. So if division appears before multiplication, you have to choose which one to do first, or do the one that's on the left. Okay. But let's take a look at this uh, kind of like before the order of operations ever existed, and then what it looks like after we decide to have an order of operations. Okay. So before that order of operation, before PEMDAS, before anything is agreed to be done, before anything else, this is what all expressions would look like. Okay. But now let's agree to do some things before some other things. Parentheses, I think, is kind of a silly thing to even include. Because if I put parentheses around something, then it naturally draws your attention to those things. That's what parentheses are for. Okay. So, yes. Parentheses are at the top. If you see parentheses around a couple of things, do that. Um, then exponents, in this case, there's no exponents. So we get to multiplication and division. So multiplication and division will go first. And what that helps us do is eliminate these parentheses right here. Because if I didn't have an order of operations and there were no parentheses there, I'd be a little confused because I would think, am I supposed to do 4 times 5? Or am I supposed to take 5 minus whatever this number is? Does that make sense? <coughs> That's the question you would ask if there were no order of operations. Which order? Do you <coughs> 5 minus that number first or 4 times that 5 first? Which one do we agree? do the multiplication before the subtraction. So now, we didn't need that set of parentheses. Also, if we take away these parentheses, and just like we agreed to do multiplication before subtraction, we agreed to do division before subtraction. So now we don't need those parentheses. Okay? Now let's keep working out. Do we need these parentheses? No. Why not? Well, it's like whatever comes, you know, left to right. Left to right. But then you go to addition and subtraction. So there's no multiplication left, right? Yeah. And then you go to division, and then you go to addition, and then you subtract. Okay. Yeah. So all that's left is addition and subtraction. There's no multiplication left. Okay. There's really no need for any of these parentheses. Right. Because if I erase all these parentheses.
because of a couple things called the commutative property and the associative property of addition, it wouldn't matter what order we do these in. We could do um, that one. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, uh, well, this would be 20 minus 6. Or we could do 1 plus 3 plus 2 minus 6 plus 20. That's not going to make any difference. Uh, we could also do, instead of doing this first, we could do 20 minus 6, take that. Um, do 1 plus 2, take that, and then we'll add the 3 plus 3, and then we'll add on what we get from 20 minus 6. The order in which we do those things, it doesn't make a difference. As long as we remember one important thing, this negative means a negative 18 thirds, right? I can't just take, uh, it matters if I take 20 minus 6, or if I take 6 minus 20. That's not the same thing. I can't switch it to the order of subtraction. But I can take a negative number and move it around, and it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't make a difference as long as I'm adding and subtracting. So with the order of operations we have eliminated in this case, all of the parentheses, we don't need any of them. And we can just add them up as we want. Uh, 1 plus 2 is 3 plus another 3. That would be 6. Plus, we multiply those together. That is a number right there. It's the number 20 minus 1836. Uh, 6 minus 6 is 0, so it's 1. <coughs> and that's it. And, and like Mikhail said, that might be kind of like a little bit of a bummer because I uh, felt like it was the right way, but there is no right way. It's just a way that most people have been convinced to do it. try at all times that I can to get you to see a lot of the things that you're doing are procedures that you've memorized and that are making it harder for you to understand that. Because once you know 1 plus 1, the rest of math follows logically. And I will do my best to take you from not understanding it to understanding it, but not from a place that I don't know how to now uh, I know step 1, 2, Whenever I can, that's, that's what I'm going to do. Sometimes we need step one, two, three. I will help it make sense as much as possible. But I'm not the kind of teacher who says, look, just do it this way. This is the right way. No, you did it wrong. It's not that you did it wrong. It's just, it's not what we agreed to. Right? Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. So let's look at a, an order of operations problem. I'm going to have you work on it on your own. Okay, remembering multiplication and division, we will agree, and it's not right and it's wrong, if we just agree that if you are trying to choose between multiplication and division, which one to do first, do the one that's on the left. Okay, read from, right, from left to right, and so that will be the thing we consider as coming first. And if you're trying to decide, whether you should uh, add these two numbers or subtract these two numbers and work from left to right. And so that, you know, if you, if you see all those minuses and you just treat those like the negatives of the numbers that they come before, you just treat that like a negative number, now you can move that negative number all over the place, up and down the order of, of addition, it would make a difference. All right, so um, this one's from the homework. Don't cheat yourself and look at your homework. Let's see. You get the same thing that you got before. And uh, if you did and it was correct, then great. If it wasn't correct the first time and it's correct now, then great as well. All right, so you've seen some great examples of what would make complete sense to do, except for we just didn't agree to do it that way, all right? Um, let's see. I think everybody did 5 minus 2 that I looked at. So let's do 5 minus 2 start with. It's got 3, 3, 7, plus 2, 2. Okay. Most people did the, the 14. That would make sense. Because like we get the multiplication, then we got addition. Do multiplication before addition. So that didn't seem to be any problem. Now let's get to the, hmm, let's not say mistakes. Let's say 
uh, things that were not in accordance to the agreement we made. Problem. What's that? Problem. Problems. Maybe some problem issues we have in trying to figure out how do we follow this order. Okay. Um, here's one. I saw in the next step on a couple this. <coughs> All right. <coughs> wrong. It's not wrong, but it is not in the order that we agreed to. What is the order that we agreed to? What would we do first in the order that we agreed to? What's that? Multiplication. Genesis multiplication, yeah. Really, the agreement allows us to not have to put parentheses around the three times three. Okay? We'll just agree that there's applied parentheses around multiplication pairs, right? As long as we work from left to right. So we'll do the three times three first, that would give us seven plus nine. Side here. Four. Let's say that most people I looked at also had 16 here. Put that inside the parentheses. And see, whenever there's parentheses, I don't think I'd ever see anybody get it wrong because parentheses are clear. And if we just use parentheses, we didn't have an order of operations. We'd never get it wrong. Uh, but we have what we have. Okay. So next, I saw this. What do you think? Think it makes sense? Four times two is eight. But we did have this agreement to do what? Left to right. Left to right. Multiplication and division equal like hierarchy left to right. Yeah. So instead of multiplying the four times the two, it would be 14 plus first do the 16 divided by four, that's four. And then we'll multiply that by two. That's 14 plus. Should we add 14 plus four? And then multiply by two? No, because we agreed. Multiplication first. 14 plus 8, 22. Oh! Yes. 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 symbols represent? Oh, variables. They are variables. What do <coughs> variables represent? Uh, numbers. numbers. Yeah. Jason. People string when they hear the word algebra. <laughs> okay, uh, Jenna, maybe a real answer? Oh, well, I was just going to say that uh, the letters represent different numbers and then the symbols represent the order that you should follow. Okay. Nice. Well, I would say other math uh, still uses the symbols like plus, minus, like all those. but. What makes algebra unique is the letter, the letter you okay. We use letters to represent something, like some number that we don't know. What's that? And then we, yeah, we use that, uh, that approach to then find the unknown. Um, but before we find the unknown, we're, we're going to get there, but sometimes the unknown is not something we have to find. Sometimes the unknown is just something we choose. We just plug it in and then find out what comes out. Right? Okay. So, Let's talk about this here. If I let A, say if A and B are real numbers, a real number is just a, a number. The only numbers that aren't real are imaginary numbers, and we don't have to worry about those yet. Okay. 
So if A and B are real numbers, that would be all the numbers, probably all the numbers you've ever used have been real numbers. Have you heard about imaginary numbers? Yes. Oh, yeah. I like unicorns. I have. <laughs> yeah, like number one, number one. Uh, and so if A and B are real numbers, just normal numbers, then A times B equals zero. Yes? I'm going to ask what must be true. What must be true? Um, one of the numbers has to be zero. Exactly. Uh, A or B must be zero. We can say that in different ways. That's the way I've said it. That, th this is the kind of thing, uh, mathematical definitions and, and these kinds of arguments, these are what I really like about math. Because if you go to another class, you cannot get this level of assurity about anything because you can argue about anything. But in math class, if I tell you that A and B are real numbers and A times B equals zero, there is no getting around the fact that A or B have to be zero. That means A has to be zero, but if it isn't, there's only one other option, that would be that B equals zero. And if it isn't, then something up here I said was false. I lied to you about something. So both of these things are true. This must, must, 100% be true. I think that's really great. We build these little scenarios, and then we figure out what must be true. That's what an equation is with an unknown in it. We figure out what has to be true if this equation is true. About math, at least in my opinion. Okay, so just a little example of what math is all about. We construct a little scenario, a scenario like two x plus seven equals forty-five, and then we figure out what must be true, what x has to be, otherwise this equation couldn't be true. Right? So we don't need to figure out that, but that is an example. Okay. So I'm going to have you write some simple algebraic expressions from words to, alpha, to symbols and, and letters. Symbols and letters. Okay. Five less than a number. Number. <laughs> Yes. This, first of all, what is that? Just say five is less than a number. So we're missing this, right? It's not that five is less than a number. No, it's not. It's five less. I'm looking for a number that is five less than some number. So. How do, if I said five less than 20, what would you do? Five minus five, that's different, right? Five minus 20, 20 minus different. Okay, what's five less than 32? 32 minus five, seven. Yeah. So in general, Dimitri? So in doesn't a number usually mean like a variable? No. A number, yeah, a number is a variable. So, uh, a minus five. Whenever we put a number in place of a, like twenty-seven or thirty-two or anything, we just subtract five. Now we have an expression that I can just plug the number in question into. Right? What's five less than twenty? Well, all I have to do is to put twenty in for a, and I'll, I can tell you that. What's five less than seventy-five? Seventy-five so seven. in there, and I do this, and there I have it. That's, that's the expression that will always give me five less than. A given number, right? Okay, let's say that. Um, uh, let's, say it's, uh, let's just say Jimmy is five times. Let's say six times. We already used five. Five, six times richer, or say as rich as uh, Billis. Billy. <laughs> so, Jimmy is six times <coughs> richer than Billy, so give me that in an algebraic expression, meaning some kind of combination of numbers and symbols and letters that represents this. 
Okay. Uh, a lot of you wrote an equation, which would fit the situation, right? We're saying Jimmy is something. Uh, and all we need to know in order to know how rich Jimmy is is to know <coughs> Billy is. <coughs> okay, so if I know Billy, hey, if I know how rich Billy is, can I know how rich Jimmy is? Yeah. Uh, if I know how rich Billy is, what will I do with how rich Billy is? Multiply by six. Six times how rich Billy is. And some of you, I, I wasn't even looking for this, but you put is equal to Jim, Jimmy's richness, right? I was really just looking for that. Just that. But that's great. Right? Now, what if Billy is uh, 75 rich? <laughs> How rich is Jimmy at that point? Thank you for actually doing what I asked. I respect that. I don't really respect joke time. 450. He is 450 rich. Thank you. Um, if Billy is 100 rich, how rich is Jimmy? Okay, if Billy is 50 rich, how rich is Jimmy? How much is 50? Huh? How much is 50? 50. Is it 50,000 dollars? 50 rich. How rich is Jimmy then? 50 dollars. 300. Billy is rich. 50 It's irrelevant. I'm 35. Okay. Look, are, are you adding to the class? Are you taking away from the class? Taking away. You're taking away. You're not adding to. The best you could be neutral, but what you're doing is taking away. Okay. So let's try and add to or be neutral. If you're neutral, we'd be quiet to add to. We would say things that help us understand the topic. The saying 75 rich is clearly a joke because it doesn't make sense. That's the point. Wasting too much time, winning out the obvious, is taking away. Okay? And it's so, funny. <laughs> what we're doing here is just called, well, this is an expression, and we are evaluating the expression for a given amount. Okay? So let's come over here real quick before we end. Okay. Why do we use pen Because uh, everybody what we agree on. Dimitri, can you answer why we do it? Yes. What's the motivation? Uh, time. Just stays parentheses in time. All right, let's go on to this one. What makes algebra different from other math? Uh, letters. Letters for numbers. More what is an algebraic expression? Um, Use some letters, yeah. numbers, some symbols, put them together. Yeah. Expression. What does it mean to evaluate an expression? <laughs> Solve. Solve. Solve is a tricky one. I know you want to say solve. Evaluate just means plug it in, write it down, plug in a number, you know, find an actual value, plug it, plug it in and see what happens. Yeah, breaking it down to its final result. Um, and we know how to write a simple value, how to make expression like five less than a number, five times a number, five times greater than a number, four more than a number, right? Yeah. Uh,